My name is Carolyn Hembry. I am a New Orleans poet and the author of Skinny and Rigging a Chevy into a Time Machine and Other Ways to Escape a Plague. I teach at the University of New Orleans and serve as the poetry editor of Bayou Magazine. I will serve as moderator of this 90 minute discussion and reading titled Workshop Lifers, celebrating the 20th anniversary of a New Orleans poetry group. Thank you, Bill Lavender, and thank you, Megan Burns, for creating and sustaining this festival. And thank you to the NOPF board. Thank you very much, Jonathan Penton. Uh, for inviting us to participate in keeping this running. I appreciate it. So over two decades ago, a small group of New Orleans teachers, uh, teacher writers resolved to meet regularly to read and critique one another's poetry. Through the Hurricane Katrina aftermath and COVID-19 pandemic, yeah, the no. workshop has continued to meet. During this virtual session, founding members will briefly discuss the poetry workshop's origins. Then all members will read in the order that they joined the workshop. First, I'll introduce our founding members for the brief origins discussion. Peter Cooley, founding member joining in the year 2000, has published 11 books of poetry, the most recent being The One Certain Thing out from Carnegie Mellon 2021. From 1975 to 2018, he was director of creative writing at Tulane and is the former Louisiana Poet Laureate. Cooley is the poetry editor of Christianity and Literature, Brad Richard. Year 2000, is the author of four collections of poetry, including Parasite Kingdom, winner of the 2018 10th Gate Prize. He is on the editorial team of The Word Works and is a faculty member of the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop for Teachers. He lives and writes in New Orleans. Kay Murphy, the year 2000, is Professor Emerita in English at the University of New Orleans. Since her retirement, uh, she continues to teach in the study abroad program and serve on MFA theses in poetry. Her most recent publication is as editor of On a Wednesday Night, an anthology that celebrates 25 years of the creative writing workshop at the University of New Orleans. So, uh, Peter, Brad and Kay, I guess my first question is, can you describe how this poetry workshop got started? Neither, neither Peter, neither Peter nor I. Peter, I think you're muted. Um, can recall which of us called whom? I remember it being Peter calling me um, to ask if I wanted to be in a workshop group, and um, I had not been in a poetry workshop um, since graduate school, and I um, was eager to to have some feedback. And Peter. Um, I knew Peter both as you know, a poet that I'd known for many years and as a guest at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts um, and as editor of North American Review, um, where he had taken a couple of my poems and given me very good feedback. So yeah, one of us called the other and that was how it started. Peter, just, you are on mute, thank you. No, I'm not. I can't remember, you asked me or I asked you and now I, I can't remember asking Kay, we just sort of got together. That was that was all there was to it, right? No, I don't remember being asked. <laughs> well, you were. You just arrived. <laughs> no, but I have tried to say, I cannot. I remember the coffee house. That's yeah. as far oh, back oh. as my memory goes on, oh. on Carrollton, right off of Orleans. It may have had a different name. Yeah, I think it did. But that was it. So that's it, all I remember. Yep, and it was us three plus Liz Thomas. Liz for, Thomas was next. And that was for a very long time. Yep. Yeah. And we met, I can't believe it, but we met weekly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Nancy was reminding uh, us that, that it was City Perk back then, yes. That was, really yep. that was uh, uh, once a week was tough, that was tough. Yeah. Well, we were all working then. We're, working yes. <laughs> we're, we're all retired now. We can barely do it every other. Every other <laughs> week. The three of us are retired. <laughs> we barely get here. <laughs> so now we've got ten members with you all, me, 
Um, Andy Young, Rodney Jones, uh, Kathleen Balma, Lori Mullen, and Allison Campbell. And Toy Derek. Who else? And Toy Derricott, yes. Um, who else has been part of this group over the years? Now, I remember Ed Skoog briefly. Right. Uh, Ed, Ed Skoog for a couple of years, oh. yeah. Um, Liz Thomas for the first few years. Uh-huh, yes, Liz Thomas. Um, Melissa Dickey, who was a former student of mine at NOCA when she moved back here with her husband, Andy Stallings. And, and they were both teaching at Tulane, too. I knew them through that. They were for, oh, um, we, um, I don't remember how this happened, but we had Major Jackson right. mm -hmm. for about a year. Right. And that was amazing. I think that, that was after his first book came out and we were, we were reading those amazing poems in his second book. He was he teaching was at Xavier, you know. Yeah. yeah, he was here because Toy was starting the yep. creative writing at Xavier and she invited him down along with Terrence Hayes. That's how, that's why he was in town. Is that right, Toy? I mean, oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was. Hey, that was a yes. That was a here, here. <laughs> um, so were you all part of sort of um, writing groups or uh, workshops outside of academia, you know? I, I mean, we the MFA often uh, burns through uh, any energy, the energy of a lifetime for a <laughs> workshop. <laughs> Were you a part of anything else uh, as far as uh, non-academic workshops? I, I was in a women's workshop we met on Monday night, put out a little anthology after, and Toy was in there. Yes, when she was in town. Uh, so, yeah, that was, although a few academics, not real academics, but no, it was a uh, women workshop. Yeah. It was lovely. <laughs> we ate and talked. Nice. That's nice. Well, what about what about you, uh, Peter, Brad? I had been in some earlier workshop here um, with various people, David Wojcik, um, Bonnie Soniak, um, Richard Speaks, and it just happens, given the employment situation, that I was after a while I was the only one left here. Everybody left from other employment, paying employment. I mean. I, um, well, first of all, I just remember two other people who have been uh, briefly part of our workshop, uh, Tanya Foster um, for a short time. And as a, as a guest, um, a certain Nicole Cooley has uh, joined us now and then. Um, but I, the, the one consistent um, sort of workshop that I've had outside of this is my best friend from college. Um, she was in the very first poetry workshop that I ever took with Marcia Southwick at Iowa, and she and I have been um, each other's readers for 40 years. Who is that? Dana Sonnenschein. She's a really fine poet, teaches in Connecticut. Okay, so given that, you know, some, some of the ones that you've talked about now have sort of, it uh, sounds like, survived over time, but that's more of a one-on-one -on -one thing, right? Am I right? Okay. Um, and some have sort of fallen apart because people have moved away, things have changed. This has managed to sort of move along for over two decades, which is why we're celebrating, yeah, mm -hmm. the celebration. Why do you think that is? Why do you think this one's made it? Just kept on. Well, I mean, I'll say immediately that um, one thing <clears throat> is the incredible quality of the feedback. Um, I feel so lucky <laughs> Rodney is saying because of Peter. <laughs> um, but really, you know, the, the, um, the quality of feedback is so good consistently. Um, and we have such, we have people looking at our work who come from such um, different 
and interesting perspectives that, you know, we'll often see our work in different, in ways that we might not otherwise see it. Um, and I, I'm gonna guess, Rodney, that maybe what you mean by because of Peter is we also have um, a group of people who are deeply dedicated to the art for its own sake. Um, so I think that's one of the main reasons. And I think one of the other reasons is we really care about each other. You know? I think we like and respect each other. We like and respect each other. And that's tremendously important. Yeah. I've, I've stayed, I think, I think the most, this may not be the answer that most would give. I have stayed because the work, uh, the diverse work of the other poets has opened up my closed mind about what poetry is and what kind of poetry I like. Because there, I just dismissed a lot of work, either because I didn't want to get into it or didn't like the way it looked. But the point is, I'm more open minded and I have a broader sense of what what poetry is and what I want to read. And I'm also in my own work, I'm more open, for example, uh, um, I've always written formal verse, but now I'm far, far open about the creative possibilities of a form and playing with it, which I think I did not do before. I was, I was pretty strict. So now uh, it's just a lot more fun. <laughs> On that note, fun. <laughs> uh, I swear that's celebratory, thank you mood and that's a perfect segue into our reading component. Great. Um, workshop members will read in the order that they joined group as best as we, they, and one can recall um, once we get together and try to recall things become even more complicated. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say Peter is going to read first um, and then Brad and then Kay uh, and then I um, I will read after them. I am a Johnny come lately of uh, joining in 2005. So uh, we'll kick it off with, with you three and then I'll, I'll read as well. Okay, you want me to start? Right. Introduce the rest of the, and then I'll introduce everybody as we go along and we'll fill out our 90 minutes easily. Okay. Um, I wanna read a poem that uh, got extensive criticism from the group to help me. And one of the assets of the group for me is what I call furniture moving. I've learned to put the refrigerator in the kitchen and not in the bathroom. Um, I've learned that the sofa does not belong on the ceiling. Yeah? You've taught me that it belongs in the living room so it, I can look out the window. That's what sofas are for. And I recall in this poem, I had to move a lot of the furniture around. And as I recall, the poem was not even in couplets or pre-verse couplets as I, when I brought it in. Um, I can't recall a lot of that. <clears throat> this poem is called Bear and it was published in the May 14th, New Yorker, May 14th, 2018, New Yorker. I'll just say um, about it. My poetry is never autobiographical, but um, I was a student in Paris when I was 20. There was a bear and there was a girl, but everything's made up, you know, it's poetry. Bear. 20, on a Paris back street, I took in a bear, brought out to entertain our gathering crowd. I shit you not, I say, in my language of that time. This really, really happened. Snouted, declawed, castrated probably, he danced on hind feet to the musics of a short whip. 20, a student whose bad French was his worst pain. Since he had a childhood he couldn't remember, and he told everyone that he was happy. That was before three friends overdosed, four more were suicides, before we lost a child, and in 12 months, my mother, father, sister died, before analysis brought back my childhood, abused by my sister until I had that pain liquidated in the words of the kind witch doctor. 
I had to puke, I said to the girl I was with that night, a bed for the quick sex of her understanding. He kept on dancing, bleeding, dancing, dancing. Poor baby, she said. She was 19. Where is she now? 20 years back, I heard LA, married three kids like me. I have these nights like tonight again, the bear comes back on hind feet to make me wonder, does she read my poetry? Probably not. Does she remember me? She was 19. Probably not, poor baby. Peter, I think you have time to read more. No, oh, that was it. That's all I brought. On, onward with someone else. I don't know. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think I'm up next then. You are. All right. Um, so I'm going to read a little selection from um, all of my books except Habitation, because Habitations was the only one that. Um, this group did not have any part in helping to shape. Um, so the first one I'm gonna read is from Butcher Sugar. And <clears throat> this is an elegy for Reginald Shepherd um, called Poem. Your voice is all afternoon. Your voice palace yielding to palace no longer, sky sounded to depths I call to whatever calling back. Your voice all I want unheard. No weather or weather, not this shirtless man or that, shaping the afternoon he jogs in rain along my avenue. Death is no God, no longer, nor you, nor I of this song make new or the world undoes. Unkind, unlike, death cannot imagine you as I can, rain falling in empty streets, almost. And second one is from Motion Studies. <laughs> And this is, I take a book from the shelf. And the title becomes a first line. I take a book from the shelf, infinity and the mind and shards of glass fall out. So I'm back in the tornado crouched with my husband and the dog in the hallway while wind seizes the house, shatters windows and rips the roof away, tar paper tossed, flapping across the freeway. So I'm back with my mother when her truck's impact flings the deer through the windshield and onto her chest, slivers in her hands for months. And when I land, I'm back in my father's flooded studio. I'm ruined canvas. I'm smashed plates. But if I shut my eyes, I'm safe in the car with my husband, crossing the parish line at the canal, crossing the bridge, dripping from lit suburbs into the dark of drowned neighborhoods, our headlights picking shards from this chaos inside me that doesn't care where I live. And I want to say about that book that thank God um, we had each other after Katrina. Thank God, because that really kept kept all of us going. Um, one from Parasite Kingdom. Um, <laughs> and I chose this one because I, I think I have to explain the least about this one. All you need to know is that this whole book is set in a very strange little kingdom. And this one is called um, How I Will Remember Paradise. Watching a wasp drowse on a windfall quince chalk dust on my last roses. Across the road where army bulldozers have raised the bombed out school, soldiers unload lumber and stack pallets of bricks for the new school they're building. Blackberry vines have trained themselves around the rebar left from the garden wall. 
One soldier stripped to the waist strides smiling through the gate and asks for a drink of water. I hand him the hose, twist the spigot, watch his lips as he sucks at the feeble stream, douses his hair, lets the water rinse his thin, dirty chest. He turns off the tap, loops the hose on its hook, asks me, is that rosemary? Yes, I tell him. His pants barely hangs on his hips. Why is he still standing here? You must be glad about the school, he says. One day, I tell him, a teacher crossing the street after lunch twitched, kneeled, and collapsed, a sniper's target practice. And then round after round of shells blasted the school and half the houses. When I could finally walk outside again, pale dust whitened every leaf and stem, no water to rinse them. They stood for weeks like that, like statues. He smiles. That sounds beautiful. Yes, I tell him. Maybe when it's safe, you'll help me clear the rubble from my garden wall. Maybe we'll find a little body, berries crushed in its fists. I step closer. Beautiful, everything. He thanks me for the water. And I'm going to read one last one. Um, that um, workshop really, really helped me with. He says, I had written a poem over the summer and the people I was with said, oh, that's a wonderful poem. Oh my goodness, what a flawless poem. And I'm like, well, thank you so much. And I brought it in and <laughs> um, I got great feedback, but immediately, and I think it might've been Laura who came up with the genius idea uh, that it had started in completely the wrong place. So that the last line really needed to be the first line, which meant completely reordering the whole thing. And I love the result. This is Zenya's. There is never enough time to see everything in the museums we visit most often. I planted 10 packets of seeds and only these sprouted, grew five feet high and blew face down in last night's storm. Watching my husband chop an onion, I think of all the poets no one reads. Rooted in air, rooted in smoke, washed away in silt-bearing floods. Don't worry, it's firm, I call out to my four-year-old godson as my right leg sinks to the knee in the mound of dirt I'm climbing. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, I joined right before Katrina. I think we we were able to have several meetings at uh, the, I guess it was the Bean Gallery, um, I think. And um, then we were gone. And uh, I guess there are two things I, uh, and there are three moments in my life that I really remember like, kind of marking group or group marking them for my uh, my memory where the kind of private and the public collide a little bit. Um, one would be, of course, Katrina. And then after we entered re the city, re entered the city before the end of 2005, um, a few of us re entered, uh, Brad and Peter. And um, I'm so sorry, Kay. I jumped right in. It's your turn. I'm going to be quiet. Go. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I wanted to hear the Katrina story. I'll tell it. But I was I, because I didn't come back for months after Katrina. So I wasn't. I know. Yeah. Okay. Get it. Uh, I'm going to read two poems. Um, the first one I have debated and debated about whether I would say something about the um, epithet. The title is the Black Pearl, Black Pearl of Paris. Um, and it's Josephine Baker. And that's what I debated about whether I would uh, say or not, but Black Pearl of Paris. 
Let's skip the bordellos and bed bugs, the bananas and feathers, and Hemingway, who swore she wore nothing but a fur when they danced the grizzly. Let's skip to her arrival, steerage class, to where she met up with the rest of the white dance troupe, entered a cafe, ordered coffee and croissants. When the order was placed before her, she was the only one to notice. The waiter had no look on his face. And the other one I brought in is, I think this poem, it made a record for how many times I brought it back to workshop, um, which also is something I did not allow myself to do at the beginning. It's like, come on, Kay, if you can't get it, <laughs> get it right after one workshop, uh, how pitiful. So, nude. Sitting in the vintage burgundy chair, cat in arm. She wants to turn the pages with her tongue, slide it over the lavender on the throat of Madame Bovary. Kiss the musk on the lips of Kafka's proprietress. Suck Bishop's thumb after throwing back the fish. The long fur of the cat makes her nipples hard. But when meditating cat on lap, she can only be the nothing that she isn't, the desire that isn't. Rising, what she knows stays on the bean-filled cushion. Sometimes the blinds are closed, sometimes not. The young man next door stands under the carport, leans on his pickup, smokes. The truck doesn't run. She imagines he sees her, not on the cushion, not in the chair not with a cat, but with her breasts bare, letting him think he is the reason. Thank you. Great God. <laughs> okay, that's poem so sexy. Whew. All right, I remember that one from workshop. Goodness gracious. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll go back before I, I absent-mindedly was prattling on. Um, so in, in 2005, um, we, uh, when um, those of us who still had, had places where we could possibly stay, and get back in the city who were able to do that and were lucky enough to be able to do that, I'll say for myself, definitely, or who had remained. Um, Peter and Brad and I started meeting again um, in, I think it was 2005. So that is impressed on sort of my memory meeting uh, at Brad's house and meeting at my house in the living room. Uh, another thing um, I, I would be in 2009, uh, when uh, my dad died and when my, uh, uh, and then my daughter was born three months later, sort of going to group, being out of group, uh, being tended to by group as these things happened and were challenging. And then jumping way ahead to um, the pandemic, right? And thinking about um, news of that. And then uh, of course, uh, the poem that I'll be reading, uh, thinking about uh, April in, in the city, in New Orleans, and uh, April of 2020, um, when COVID was so, so horrible in that initial wave. And um, I don't 
the poem I'm going to read, I don't really remember writing it. It was sort of, we were, we had switched from, switched modalities for the first time from face to face to Zoom, which has kind of, which has stuck because some of our, our members have moved away. Um, and so we didn't want to lose them. And so we, we stuck with Zoom so we could continue to be with these folks. And I think that um, as I wrote this poem, I, I guess what, what group, you know, it's, it's like, it's a, it's a group of friends. It's people I know will be there for me kind of no matter what uh, the situation is, however bad it is. It's even if I don't have readers, I've got these nine people who are, um, I, you know, have to deal with it. And so that's nice as well. So I'll, I'll read a poem from from that time period and then uh, turn it back over. Um, April 2020, New Orleans. That hem hath open one that they were seca. The general prologue, the Canterbury Tales. Not big on pilgrimages, yet this fever drifts from house to house. One leaky pea rogue, a drift empty listing to one side on the bayou. I look inside my neighbor's yellow house. Joy of a yellow house. Shades up, rainbows chalked on the walkway under a palm's moving shade. Palm or monk parakeets nest. I play like it's mine. My neighbor's breakfast nook, the playpen, a last cold bite. A friend was topping off my glass last night when a rolling violin solo, a show tune, woke me. Here, prone is transitive to roll the sick onto their stomachs so they breathe. Transitory strings receded down the avenue. Above night transit, lighter now. Night birds sang, yes, we hear you again. I sang along, mask maker, mask maker, make me. Not a carnival mask on one you don't know you know until they're in you. Breathy sobriquet, dark alcove the quarter. No. The other kind of mask, so we breathe for centuries alone. Today, I walk through another April shower under April canopies where my thoughts footnote old lines. Warm that April, perish, pilgrims arrive on winds, on foot, by bike, by car, by bus, by streetcar. Nowhere to be, no intercessor, I join them. We roam the neutral ground weeping Scrolling news on screens that light our masks. So many magnolia petals. Our hair, the wind scrolls. <laughs> Andy Young, I am delighted to say, joined us in 2006, her second full-length collection, Museum of the Soon Departed, was recently chosen for the inaugural Patricia Spears Jones Award by Camperdown NYC Press. She is also the author of All Night It Is Morning, out from Dialogos Press in 2014, and four chapbooks. She teaches at the New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts. I give you Andy Young. So um, I, I'm going to read a few new poems because of our Zoom situation. I'm able to actually see what I sent them and then see what it is now. I don't generally save my revisions. Um, I don't want to see them after I've changed them. So um, it, it was kind of hard. It was a fun process to go through and see. Um, what has changed and it was kind of I realized it was really hard for me to see what had changed with the older stuff that's just how much um I, I see it as like the influence of this group is just so embedded into my work that it's hard to even pick it apart 
um, and I've, I've definitely I've written about and spoken about the, the sense of community that I think for me has been incredibly um, sustained uh, among the poets and um, you know, we're, it's kind of an anti-capitalist venture we're taking part in, which already makes us uh, a, a kind of subset <laughs> or subset or something, sub something of culture. Um, so that's super important to me, but um, I've already talked about that. So I just wanna say that the poems I'll read, I think what has helped the most is being able to kind of um, trim the fat away and see what it is I'm really trying to say, um, that there's that reflection back that really helps me figure out what I'm trying to say, which is no small thing, because I usually have no idea. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna read a couple new ones and then I'll end with another poem um, that I'll say something about. My mother stares out from my face through a wine glass. A dark bloom through the wine glass where my mother's face, no, mine, looks out. The late fall sky upside down, upside down the saffron tinted maples tossing out this year's leaves to rot. She, I, smile a smile that's not aware it's seen. Here's to you, fingertips at the stem, glass raised, my mother's mouth holding back laughter as light carves the afternoon into epitaphs. Rust, her, my hair, rust, the pale wine where Tennessee light skinny dips in our glass. Her gaze pours down the goblet's curves to the absence of the one looking. Family evacuation with Gulf fritillary caterpillars. Hurricane Ida, August 29th, 2021. Our friends who shelter us grew a maypot vine these last three years so they could offer food to the Pensacola caterpillars who gorge now on poison of its blooms, which are purple and intricate as geodes. The edge of the storm tracked us here. Its tongue lolls huge and gray across the horizon. Ancestral butterflies flash orange against the grass like an emergency. Some of the caterpillars have wrapped themselves in cloaks and hang still as they liquefy. Portrait of the couple in a French Quarter apartment. Our daughter found a picture of us in a book I've never read, a souvenir from an old life a postcard of our past, now a bookmark in a riot girl book. My chin tipped up, my arms offering a big bowl of something to whoever holds that camera. A strainer beside my head hangs against the dingy yellow wall. I'm sassy like, you want some? Hip turned, head cocked, a stone choke around my throat. My panties a bright white beneath white dress from the overhead light in the tiny rectangular kitchen. I might be bringing out dessert as there you are, washing dishes, bare chested, penny hued in the evening light, your sweat beaded neck tilted down as you rinse a dish. Oh, and there's the small yellow oven where you cooked our wedding lamb and the lamb after Katrina for all the friends who'd returned. The oven so small, we held the door shut with a school desk. Look at us. We don't know we will be a mother, a father. Don't know of the floods yet or all the impossible mercies. In this moment, your mother is alive. My mother is alive. Roberta and Shaima are alive. Can you hear the drumming beneath the sound of sink water, seven day candles lit in the next room where the women sway and call the spirits down. Come down mothers, come down. My love, just look how we made a feast with such insouciance. And I'm going to end with a poem that I, I'm not sure really was changed much um, to be honest, um, but it was part of a, a project, a character, a thing that I made about a um, character named John Swenson. And I sort of worked on this by myself, 
certain of my insanity and um, shared it with the group. And yes, they, they may have affirmed that, but they also affirmed that I should keep doing it. Um, so I had a really good time um, writing John Swenson, um, became John Swenson Dynamicon, um, a, a little chat book. And, and so I'll just end with this, uh, his origin story, John Swenson origin story. John Swenson was born on Mohammed Street, surrounded by smoke and graffiti martyrs. John Swenson has three brothers, all named John Swenson. John Swenson will lead you to the golden mummies hidden in the desert oasis. John Swenson knows the habits of the oldest monks and the way to their original cave. John Lennon dreams of being John Swenson. John Swenson dreams of being John Swenson. John Swenson, the blibble mascus. John Swenson is a pickled dead fish. No, the small darting pink one, or maybe the fluttery purple beta also dead. The best lecture ever on Mediterranean trade rates was given by John Swenson. John Swenson chocolate milk, John Swenson the movie, John Swenson on night duty, John Swenson is a pickle, John Swenson is a sea salt potato chip bent in the middle, John Swenson, John Swenson when screens go dark, when the channels scramble, when the satellites sputter and fall from the sky. John Swenson when the planets align with the pyramids. John Swenson, saying three times. John Swenson with four pillows he takes to the pyramids in case he wants to jump. John Swenson is a woman digging small pyramids. First, she piles rocks, carrying, not throwing them carefully so as not to endanger anyone. For the other part of the operation, she uses small shovels. Thank you so much for giving me permission, my group. Thank you, Andy. Rodney Jones, I see you is the author of 11 books of poetry. Among the awards he has received are the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Kingsley Tufts Pro Poetry Prize, and NEA and Guggenheim Fellowships. His books have been shortlisted for the Griffin International Poetry Prize, finalist twice for the Pulitzer Prize, and a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Poetry Award. Rodney Jones. Always an undertaker, never a corpse, I guess I should say. Um, poetry workshops are very important to people my age who are retired. We need help. <laughs> we need help with our poems. We need good company. And I dare say we need the truth when it's possible. And in this workshop, the people are very serious. They are also very silly and delightful to me. It's, it's wonderful company. Thank you, Poetry Group. I'm gonna read three poems. Uh, the first is called To Kill a Mockingbird. At the beginning of sixth grade, when I learned that a man, Mr. Key, was to be my teacher, I was dismayed. Mrs. Anders, the other sixth grade teacher with whom I was in love, was pretty and efficient and had taught my sister who had never made a B. And also, I possibly assumed teaching, like giving birth, was a thing men did not do. Plus, Mr. Key was old. He slept a lot. He spat tobacco juice into a tin beneath his desk. While we his students conjugated to lie and to lay or endured an ending division, he read the Wall Street Journal. He left often, for he was also principal. And each time he left, my friend Pete Petty would kneel, chuckle, and start to gnaw on my shoulder. I do not know why he did that. He was not predatory. 
but would not stop when asked, he persisted, chewing deeper, leaving tooth marks until one day resolved to end it. I took the football I always carried. And just as I brought it down on Pete's head, hello, Mr. Key. But no expression on his face, no sign that soon each morning, Pete would be cranking the flag up the pole and in the afternoon, lowering it, walking it inside, folding it into a perfect triangle and then laying it in a cabinet. My punishment was reading. Alone in his office, an hour and a half after lunch, reading To Kill a Mockingbird. And he never explained why this book, its plots and themes, I thought of the death penalty. I thought of it again and again, and then Mr. McKee would return with bucket, soap, water, and rag, and make me kneel in the bathroom and scrub graffiti from the wall above the toilet, saying I would need to lead to learn these words too, coming from a Christian home, a country boy, but college material. I don't think things necessarily get worse or are better, but um, I was struck deep laid during the Watergate era. Maybe because it's possible always to despise one person. And at one point, Nixon was that person that I despised. Watergate. For many in the United States, the word brings a phase when mortars in Vietnam still whistled around them and the scandal of Nixon and his Machiavellian buds poured from the news into their subconscious. I see that Watergate too, the televised hearings and in particular one session, Sam Urban had just asked Ehrlichman or Dean or Haldeman a long wist winded periphrastic left breaching question it must have lasted 40 seconds and seemed three days before he paused for effect. And Ehrlichman, Ardeen, or Haldeman answered, Senator, could you please repeat the question? And he did, verbatim. And that is one water gate. But I think also of the morning my father sent me to the creek that ran through our pasture to remove a dead calf, a flood had floated north to lodge against our water gate. A little Guernsey heifer, I had petted her often. Now flies buzzed around her, bloated and entangled in the mesh. And I remember her eyes were open, so she seemed to watch as I pulled first one leg, then another from the vines and wire that it trapped her and pulled her to the bank through the shallow water. Because the second water gate, which features the tender relationship between a dead calf and a little boy happened 20 years before the first, in which men break into an office complex and a hotel. I prefer its posts and hog wire that kept cows from a neighbor's field to the gray rows of filing cabinets that brought down a presidency. The water pours out of the mountain and runs to the sea. Sometimes I say it to myself until the meanings leave. I say Watergate until it is water pouring through water. One of the, the subjects of the following poets, poem, is with us in the room and has occasionally shown his tail here. It's kind of curled down around the edge of the screen. Uh, this is called for Katie and it's almost an introduction for Katie who will be coming next um, for Katie. When Milo was a kitten and spent the night with us in the big bed curled like a brown sock at our feet he would wake before daybreak, squeak plaintively in his best Burmese cat castrato soprano and make bread on our stomachs until if one of us did not rise, sleepwalk to the kitchen and open his can of food, he would steal under the covers, crouch, run hard at us, jam his head in our armpits, 
and burrow fiercely. Probably he meant nothing by that, or he meant it in cat contrary, just as he did not intend drawing blood the day he bolted out the door and was wild again for nearly three hours. I could not catch him until I knelt, wormed into the crawl space under a neighbor's house and lured him home with bits of dried fish. Or he meant exactly what he smelled and smelled the future as it transmogrified out of the past. For he is, if not an olfactory clairvoyant, a highly nuanced cat, an undoer of complicated knots who tricks cabinets, who lives to upend tall glasses of Merlot with his whole body. He has censored the finest passages of Moby Dick. He has silenced Beethoven with one paw. He has leapt three and a half feet from the table by the wall and pulled down your favorite print by Miro. He does not know the word no. When you ask the vet what kind of cat he was, she went into the next room, came back and said, Havana Brown. The yellow eyes, the voice, the live spirit that plays into dead seriousness and will not be punished into goodness, but no. An ancient, nameless breed. Me, he says, and I answer in cat, even if I was not born in Birmingham between a moldy cabbage and an expired loaf of bread, I too was rescued by an extravagant one. Thank you, workshop. Thank you, Rodney. <laughs> and to an extravagant woman, <laughs> Kathleen. Kathleen Balma is the author from your hostess at the TNA Museum. Black Springs Press Group put out this collection just a hot minute ago in 2022. And I understand it is uh, available through NOPF. So it'll be at the book table for this group. Uh, Kathleen Balma's recent poems have appeared in Best New Poets and the Troubadour International Poetry Prize Anthology, anthologies. Her awards include a Fulbright grant and a Pushcart Prize. She works at the New Orleans Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn and Rodney for the introduction. Um, I have three poems for you today. Lap dance with no ending. There's a bouncer in this poem watching you read it. His name is Vic. Vic won't make eye contact won't bug you unless I signal the stress. I've never had to do that in poetry yet. He was in the army, discreet as a landmine. So long as you keep still and do nothing while I work, he won't interrupt this lit experience. Vic may or may not have killed. He may or may not use meth. He does work out. He does know my routine. He's seen me do it dozens of nights. He knows all the words to the money songs. His peripheral vision is muscular. It sees every crook and swerve of me, though he and I don't speak and I have never touched him. It's crucial that you fear him while my naked's in your face. Only sometimes you need more. The dog tags looped through my shoe strap. Those aren't Vicks. I can defuse a bomb with my teeth. I thought a lot about what to say about workshop and the role that it has played for me. I've been an on again, off again member of workshop, sometimes taking very long breaks, sometimes swearing that I'm done and not coming back and then coming back anyway. The workshop has been infinitely patient with these um, bipolar 
um, participation um, jaunts of mine and um, very welcoming always if I decide that I'm ready to be a full participant again. And for that, I am very grateful. Um, I think that the poems that I'm reading today wouldn't exist without this workshop. And, um, you know, they're poems that are autobiographical to a large extent, and they are poems that touch on a period of my life that I would never, ever in a million years have written about for a grad school workshop. That just would not have happened. I was able to write them and turn them into this workshop because this workshop was a place where I felt comfortable and safe doing that. So um, thank you, all of you. This poem is called Punchline. One night I was the first dancer in the bar. My shift hadn't started. I had time to get ready. I had the dressing room to myself. I was in the right frame of mind for work. The owner was a biker named Van Zant. He was a 50 something strawberry blonde short and beardless with long hair. The bar, the bar was called Changes. Van owned another bar, a biker bar called Van Zant's. I had the dressing room to myself. I had my pick of chairs. I was getting into my good money head. Van came downstairs with a green handled broom. He was trying to look serious. He was serious and trying to look dire. He did not want sex. He had karate on his mind. He was drunk. I was in stilettos. We stared at each other. We knew each other's names, his full name, my stage name. I don't remember my stage name then. Van laid the tip of the broom handle on the counter and held it out like a limbo stick. I'm really good at limbo. I made a joke about it. He stared at the handle and made slow chopping motions. Hold the broom, he said. I didn't know this man. The dressing room was at the ass end of the building. The building was huge with a maze of halls and empty side rooms. How fast could I get up the stairs? I would need to get out of my heels first. They weren't the kind you could just kick off. They had long straps that wrapped around the ankles and tied. I don't wanna hold the broom. Hold the broom. What are you going to do? I'm going to chop it in half with the power of my hand. You're too drunk. I'm not drunk. You can barely walk. I'm not drunk. I can do this. Hold the broom. I don't think that's a good idea. Hold it. No. Van loved on the unbroken broom with his eyes. I'm not going to hurt you. I know what I'm doing. I just want to get dressed here, man. I've done this before. I'm good at it. Find somebody else. You're the only one here. Cherry comes early, she'll help you. I need to do this now. Dude, just, just hold it. No, sir. I'll fire you. I can fire you. There are other bars. I'm not going to fire you, okay? This will be quick. You won't even feel it. Hell no. What are you afraid of? Splinters. A titty bar is a funny place. You don't think it gets funny in there? You don't think it's hysterical fun? It was a slow night. I made $400. I don't know if that was seven minutes. Was it seven? 
I had a third one just in case, but I don't want to overread. You're not overreading. Please okay. read it. <laughs> um, so I have to say, my last poem is called Nude Bar, but just for the record, Toy would like me to change the title to Titty Bar. We have discussed this. <laughs> and I said, Toy, I can't call it Titty Bar. I have titty in another poem that's too many titties in one book. You know, like I can't use that word. Oh, I can't overuse it. And she said, why not? Put titty in all your poems. Titty, titty, titty. <laughs> and I'll just never forget her saying that. And um, it gave me a great permission. Um, so nude bar or titty bar as you prefer is the title. I wanted to write about the dressing room. How, if I ever had a harbor, that was it. Those rooms with those women and how stupid excited I was like all the other tourists when I paid the extra fee to view the harem of Topkapi only to find the drabbest part of the palace complex. Flat white walls, bare stone floor. Why didn't I expect that? I who had known such places and knew better like everyone else, I was lured by the fantasy question, what went on in there? Here's what goes on backstage. A lot of naked women, sure. But they're not training for fellatio on bananas or rubbing each other with lavender oil. They're bickering over who gets to sit in what chair. They're not spreading their legs on a bearskin rug in front of a lit fireplace. They're spreading the word about who's tipping tonight and who never tips. They're complaining about the new girl, occasionally passing a joint. They're doing homework, possibly for your class. There's very little fighting, but sometimes big talk of fighting. There is no decor, just some old carpet and a bathroom big enough for 1.5 people to shower and shit. What did you imagine? What did you come here for? Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much. I'm glad you read us that last poem. Laura Mullen is the author of eight books. Recognitions for her poetry include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, an Arana Jaffe Award. Recent poems have appeared in Fence, Together in a Sudden Strangeness, and Bettering American Poetry. Bear with me. Uh, her translation of Veronique Pitolo's, Pitolo's Hero was published by Black Square Editions, and her translation of work by Stephanie Chelou has just appeared in Interim. A collection of poems is forthcoming from Solid Objects Press in 2023. She teaches at Wake Forest University. Laura Mullen. Hey, hey. Hi, Jonathan. I'm going to ask you to enable screen sharing for this. Sure. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm just going to start by circling back and thanking both Bill and Megan again for this astounding festival and for keeping it going. Incredible. I want to thank Carolyn for putting tonight together. Really extraordinary amount of work. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge for a moment the many galaxies, because I would feel remiss if I didn't say that um, New Orleans has a host of workshops like this. You find out about them and they're all spectacular. And I hope that maybe this can be a feature of all festivals, but like a workshop, every a local workshop, every festival would be fantastic. Um, I'm also gonna say, I just can't wait to say this. Um, I, between graduate school, when I understood that workshops were terrible and 2014 or whatever year it was I joined, I, there's no way, there was no way I would be in a workshop. Absolutely no way. 
And the hilarious thing is I was teaching them for that whole time and thinking, no way, no way would I ever, ever, ever. Mostly because a workshop, as we all know, when it's bad, um, you've invited a cadre of young medical students into the room. You've wheeled a living patient vulnerable in, and you've told them that they all need to make a cut, even though they have no idea what medicine is. <laughs> it's a disaster. Um, this workshop, on the other hand, is like one of those really cool sessions in house where like all the experts sit around and they just like diagnose perfectly and then they fix the patient and then it's all wonderful. I'm not going to read a poem that I wrote in the workshop. Um, there, my friends here have been incredibly helpful, but in fact, I'm going to show the latest thing I did because you made me the person who could do this. So if I can share this, I will. Um, let's do this, let's see if I can do this thing. Okay, here goes up on Vimeo, get rid of the faces, make it full screen and play. Maritime forest, the live oaks, green trees greeting the storm star. What shapes you take, reaching out toward never touching each other in this stilled instant of ongoing dance. I trace your lines as if to learn how far one can venture from a central support, rising away from and staying true to the earth. Teach me to stay in the steady, slow exploration of air. Show me how to grow always more open extending acceptance to what is while bearing the weight of my desire for what might yet happen, formed as I am, like you, by forces seen and unseen, twisted by occult despairs, lifted by encouragements confessed in the way this body moves among other bodies. Let me always do my absolute unremarkable best naturally as you do. Am I not also a lichen splashed, rough and fragile instance of life? Let me grow out from my heart like a ripple from a drop of rain in widening wood, a part of the forest belonging, the seemingly empty embrace, a gesture of gratitude, recognition of the invisible plenitude that does sometimes diminish or change but sustains all of us connected and separate, arms outstretched, asking and receiving, welcoming and releasing, celebrating and mourning in this lively stillness of new and ancient growth, remind us to rise from rock snared sand and anchor that shifting to lift a canopy over others still trying to thrive on the dream thin edge of some barrier island exposed to highways on the hard, hard rush of the winds, salt. Thank you, Laura. Alison Campbell is the author of the Prose Poetry Collection, Encyclopedie of the Common and Encompassing. Her work has appeared in such places as Copper Nickel, Cincinnati Review, Tampa Review, Witness, and Rattle. She lives in New Orleans. Alice. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, thank you, um, Bill and Megan. And um, thank you, poets of this workshop. Going so late in, or like going in my position, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, it's all so good. What can I, what can I do? Um, I'm glad that Laura brought up the, um, 
medical parallel because I was thinking about workshop and um, I have a shrink. She's actually a counselor, but I call her my shrink. And I, when I describe her to people, I'm like, you know, she doesn't change my life, but I talked to her for a while and then she names what's happening. <laughs> and um, I noticed that when I bring a piece of workshop, um, it's a little bit like that in terms of um, talking about something on the page. And I don't really know. I don't, I don't always know um, what it is. And so I wanted to read a poem that was uh, a perfect example of this um, because I brought the poem uh, as a rough draft workshop um, and I was actually writing about a syndrome, a mental illness syndrome, um, but I didn't know I was. And then Brad was like, I think there's a name for this. <laughs> and the name is Stendhal syndrome. Um, so I don't know if you guys remember this, but I, I got a lot of really good response about changes to the poem. And I also got, you know, what the hell was going on to me that I was describing in the poem. And then um, lo and behold, this poem was published by Xavier Review. And then um, a friend was editing a um, spot on Best American Poetry website where they were doing New York School Diaspora. And um, she felt that this poem fell into that camp. So um, I will read Stendhal Syndrome. Stendhal Syndrome. Ever wanted to make love to a work of art, die in the obscene smear of paint or a written passage where the protagonist stands on a Sears Tower diving board, but then climbs down? Ever mirrored a mannequin and felt you were falling into its apparel, the fabric swimming you? Sometimes listened to music with the back of your head or took a moment in the bath to observe the water in opposition with your hair. Had a pop song puncture to nerve by amplifying something hidden, finding a stranger knew your feelings exactly, but more so. Decided nature is wonderful, but alive. You needed acrylic, oil, the page, a breathing note, or a warm drink in a white cafe designed by someone rich from drawing children in animal suits. It's not that you cannot go on living without these things. It's that without them, you have questioned the point. So workshop was such a great help with this, um, naming the thing. And but then it was kind of scary when I researched it. It's like pretty severe illness that people can get after being in Florence that you're overwhelmed by art. But um, I enjoyed it as well, um, experiencing it and writing the poem. Um, the other thing that I want to say about workshop is kind of similar to the, the cadaver uh, situation or the medical one is like you bring a poem to workshop and it's kind of like if you're taking your car into the shop and you're like, maybe I just need to have fix a little something, you know, maybe it's just, uh, you know, the brakes or something. And they're like, actually, you need a whole new carburetor or whatever it is. Um, and the workshop is um, kind of goes back to the honesty that someone um, brought up and the trust and respect that. I can bring something and maybe I don't want to know that it needs all that it needs, but it needs it. And the workshop can tell me that. And um, for that, I'm so, so grateful. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to read is just a very short occasional poem that I wrote today for the workshop. Um, yeah, because it's about the workshop, as you could imagine. <laughs> um, I hope no one is uh, like offended, but very short. I, I wrote it in this mode. It's called Accolades to Participants of Poetry Workshop. And then I started writing and I was like doing this, someone of this, of that. And I realized it's like a knighting, like when they say like, you know, knight of the green forest or whatever, it's kind of like knighting um, everyone in workshop. So <laughs> just kind of going to read that. Um, and that is all. So accolades to participants of Poetry Workshop. Peter of the Big Cuts. You don't need it. The poem doesn't need it. Carolyn of the Eyes. Wide to members of Workshop and Sharp to hear cadence, the word note tuned wrong. Rodney of the Stories. A dog he had or knew and somehow has the answer to one particular part of the poem. Katie of the Keep It. Telling what doesn't need changing. K of the secrets, asking questions the poem asks which you can't answer. Brad of the plants, he grows to 
he grows to always catch the right word. Andy of the not obvious, vulnerable, pointing to what the poem doesn't tell her. Laura of the landscape, architect of line breaks and loose with her rearrangement. Toy of the heart, so present and direct, disarming the art from its matter. Me, grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Our final reader uh, and recipient of the Academy of American Poets 2021 Wallace Stevens Award and the Poetry Society's 2020 Frost Medal for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement in Poetry. Joy Derricott is the author of 2019 National Book Awards finalist, I, New and Selected Poems. She co-founded Cave Canem with Cornelius Eady in 1996, Toy. Hi, everybody. You know, uh, I don't get to hear a whole reading of these wonderful poets. I hear one poem and then we chop it all up. <laughs> and I need more readings like this. Wow. What, what great poets. You know, I just love these your poems, how lucky I am. You know, I'm, I'm really a uh, soul New Orleans person. I live in Pittsburgh, but if I could be in New Orleans all the time, I would. And um, Kay asked me if I would join if I wanted to join, and then she asked the workshop people if they would have me. And I was just so honored to be among these wonderful poets whose work I got to know and whose, I don't know what you call it, it's reverence for poetry that I sense. I think going through what you go through to live in New Orleans makes you very special. I think it makes you a very special person and then that does something to the way you love poetry because the people in New Orleans, the people in this group have so many qualities that are very complex. Uh, reverence for, for the individual voice and for poetry itself and humor and uh, acceptance of diversity in our styles. We're all so different, but nobody tries to make you like everybody else. I don't know how people do that. They seem to go where you are and let you be that and help you be that. So they're irreverent too. They make me laugh a lot. And uh, they're sort of like being friends with the bad boys and girls that smoke behind the church in the eighth grade. They're a little bit like that. Actually, they're a lot like that. And um, but then they're very, very loving. You know, they let me go back to Pittsburgh and they still did Zoom. I don't want to bring it up too much because maybe they'll realize they need to change. <laughs> but I love these people so much. And uh, I wouldn't be able to do the work I'm doing now if I didn't have them. So uh, one of the things, I'll read this poem that they helped me with. It's a strange poem, but then uh, I just read an article in the New Yorker that where they're talking about uh, Winslow Homer. 
did you see that? It was in the uh, New Yorker this week. And this is a poem I wrote about Winslow Homer. They talked about how uh, Winslow Homer has uh, a sense of compassion for the slaves that he painted and the black people he painted. There's a cartoon in the, uh, during COVID times, there's a cartoon in the New Yorker in which Alexa answers her owner's question about today's weather. Why? Where the fuck do you think you're going? Times are changing. There are all kinds of ways to change what we're thinking. Kara Walker's silhouettes remind us of everything we don't want to know we know. I wonder about the gorgeous black faces writ large now in movies. If the gorillas and sambos of the past will slowly fade and become more like that black sailor in the painting by Winslow Homer. His boat nearly capsized, shark circling, his beauty expressed in a casual stroke of paint that illuminates his chest bone, everything useless except his will to survive. I've been writing some things that I don't know what they are and I don't call them anything. And then the, this group told me they were poems. Sort of scary to think of them as poems, but maybe I can. They help you to think in new ways like Laura said, and all of our poets tonight said that. Sonia Henney. There was a famous woman skater in my childhood, Sonia Henney, a three-time gold medal Olympian figure skater. She became a Hollywood star, the first skater who went around the world performing in packed venues like Madison Square Garden, places that today host stars like Elton John and Billie Eilish. Parents took their children for a special Saturday outing, everyone dressed up as if all the kids in America had awakened one morning and said to their parents, the one thing you could do to make me so happy I will forgive you for all your drunk beatings is to take me to see Sonia Henney. Who thought this up? We knew our parents had to buy the tickets. They had to plan to it to make us happy. We knew the tickets were out of their budgets. They had to bleed money. They had to suffer, which may have added to our happiness. For one night, we knew where our fathers were and what they were doing. How did the idea catch on so that every family in America that wanted to do something guaranteed by the people who promoted it to give their kids one night of joy? I remember being taken to the ice capades one year, and as I was watching them do their amazing squirrels and leaps, I began to wonder why I wasn't feeling joy. Often I had to pretend with my parents that I was having fun, trying to make them happy, opening the presents my mother had wrapped on Christmas morning after the huge fight about the wounded Christmas tree my father drunk had arrived home with at midnight. So many presents that in the morning I'd step on them, blindfolded, screaming, was it in fear or happiness? Already I was feeling what I didn't understand, that I didn't understand what I was supposed to feel. Were other children acting? Or did they really feel something for Sonia Henney? What made them hang over the railings? What made them so serene in their rabbit skin collars as if their fathers had never knocked their mother into the kitchen table, never beat them until they crawled along the floor begging? All seemed forgiven. The things that you might not ever in your whole life forgive them for, and if you still helped them when they were old and couldn't help themselves anymore or called once a year on Christmas, you still kept in your heart a burning coal just so that you would never forget what was done to you. Perhaps it was then at that fork in the road where most people let go of pain that I started to blur the paths that different feelings take. 
Perhaps I keep alive that little girl watching Sonia Hinney squirrel, make that little scraping sound with her ice blades, kick, kick up a little pile of dimmed ice behind her and lift her leg. And my last poem, for my light skin. I can only be forgiven by black people for the million times I walked down the street and no one knew I was there. As if I were tiptoeing, as if I took myself back from existence. For the hundreds of times my mother and I walked to galleries at Hudson's not a dark soul to be found. The furniture behind red ropes, untouchable. For all the places she and I kept eating our sandwiches. My mother liked minestrone soup on the 13th floor where the white waitresses wore dull green dresses and caps. I always enjoyed a hot fudge sundae. Only black people can judge me. Only they know the anguish inserted in history when some ancestor of mine took the place of one who went to the back. What was done made me. Only black people can know who I loved most, for whom I have done good. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Joy. That was gorgeous. Thanks, Carol. This concludes our reading. Thank you, friends. And I just want to say, am I coming through? Um, Thanks to you all in the workshop for putting this together for the festival. I hope that New Orleans Poetry Festival is as long lived and productive as this workshop has been. Uh, was really an amazing event and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and don't forget, we're only just getting started. There are like three events tomorrow. I think they're at 3 p.m., 5 p.m., and 7 p.m. Check them out, oh. nolapoetry.com, and uh, more stuff on uh, Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we start the live events. For those of you who are in New Orleans, come out to the Saturn Bar uh, for a, um, an old fashioned reading where people uh, have actual physical bodies. And um, uh, then on Friday night is our international feature, which is going to be at Zeitgeist. Uh, this year, uh, Jonathan Root and I were just out there working out the logistics of it. It's like a uh, hyper real um, uh, kind of, um, you know, half real, half live, half zoomed event on a big movie screen, but with real people in front of it. Um, so you should come check that out and see um, see what the future holds. And then, of course, this weekend at Greenway Station, um, come down Saturday and Sunday. Uh, there's uh, a readings all day long and the small press fair and all that stuff. And we're still trying to struggle to come back from COVID uh, and the uh, changes that have happened, but we are, uh, we're 
trying to rise to the occasion and I think we've come up with some innovative things. So, um, but the important thing is, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all in the workshop for putting this together and just being there. Thanks. Bye. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye